So I came to this country in 2005. I came as a student um, to Texas, actually, and um, that, that's, where I went my, uh, that's where I met my beautiful wife. You can see her here. And so she wasn't my wife at the time, but uh, as we were dating and we fell in love with each other, we decided to get married. But, you know, there is a process. Uh, I don't know how many of you immigrated to this country. Uh, anybody here is an immigrant? There's one, two, three. Okay, there's few. So you may know what I'm talking about, especially if you married somebody that is a U.S. citizen. But uh, so we got married, and then uh, I had to go through a process to an interview with a government official to make sure that we are really married. Now, they didn't just take our word that we love each other and all that. They wanted some proof, right? So we had to go through an interview process. And, uh, you know, thank God everything went well. And uh, I was given a um, residence card. And so I could legally stay and work in this country. But uh, a couple years later, we went together on a mission trip with a group of students. And so after our mission trip, we were coming back, and I had to present my um, uh, immigration documents so I can come to this country. And as I was looking, I could not find my green card. And I looked and I looked, and I couldn't find it anywhere. So we were traveling from uh, Hungary to Netherlands. From Netherlands, uh, we were supposed to fly to US. So I got my, we, we um, successfully traveled our first leg, and now we're getting ready to board on the plane to the US. And I started to get a little nervous, as you can imagine. And then I, I thought it was in, the card was in my wallet. So I gave. Uh, the wallet to my wife so that she can check and she started to look everywhere and she couldn't find it and I got that you know that feeling like oh no we're gonna be separated now and I was imagining I'm gonna have to go back to Serbia I'm gonna have to go reapply and who knows how long it's gonna take and what's gonna happen before we can be together again and so we were um, a little bit nervous and uh, so we talked to the um, the staff there, and um, they said, they told me to wait, and they got a, a person who looked very official. He had a briefcase, and uh, he, I found later on that he was a, um, an FBI agent, and he was going to talk to me, and um, he started to ask me some questions. He asked me, how long did we know each other? Where did we meet? What school did I go to? Uh, when did I get married? And, um, and then he um, uh, took his phone after he made a couple of phone calls and then showed to my wife and said, it said, do you know who this is? And she says, yes, this is the love of my life. <laughs> so he had my picture, apparently, and he got things verified. And so I was given the uh, permission to get on the plane. But I don't have the green card, no visa, no green card, and no U.S. passport. So I did have Serbian passport, but I needed visa. So uh, finally we got on the plane, and uh, the students and everybody were waiting for me. And so uh, once I got there, they all started cheering and clapping, and they were excited and happy. But I knew still that I had to go through immigration once I get to the U.S. And I actually have a friend who got turned back after he got to U.S. And so that kind of kept ringing in my mind, you know, as a possibility. So once I got here, I think it was in Atlanta, actually, um, uh, you know, I got to the immigration and he was asking me for my, you know, passport or a green card. And I was like, I, I don't have it. And he's like, how are you on American soil without, you know, the proper documentation? So uh, I was trying to explain, um, and uh, in the midtime, somebody came and uh, started talking to him, and all suddenly he just handed me this paper and said, fill this in. And so I filled it in, and then um, thank God I was allowed to come in without the green card or the passport or the visa, 
And I had to actually begin the process right there and then to get a new uh, green card. So I was uh, given a provision to be able to come in. And I believe that was by the grace of God. And you know, each one of us were given a provision by God to be able to be part of God's kingdom. And we heard earlier in the presentation that provision has been made for each one of us. And we learned that it is a gift from God. We, I didn't deserve this um, uh, privilege, but it was given to me. And so the Bible says that we are saved by, by grace. It says, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And we learned a little bit about that just earlier. Now we're going to look a little bit more into what is grace. So most people believe, at least uh, those who have uh, studied or read the Bible, believe that the grace is unmerited favor. Is that correct? It's something you don't deserve. It's something that is given to you. It's a favor shown to you. And, but there is another aspect of grace that most people may not be familiar with. And the Bible talks about it. And we read in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, And he said unto me, this is uh, Paul speaking, uh, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So what is grace according to this verse? Here, underline it for you just to make it easier. So Paul here is asking God to remove this uh, infirmity that he had in his flesh. But God responds and says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then he says, for my strength, strength is made perfect in weakness. So the grace of God is equal to his strength, right? And then it says that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the grace of God is the power of God given to us. But for what purpose? We're going to look at that in just a moment. Now, the Bible also says that grace has appeared to all men that brings salvation and appear to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he may redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So what does grace do here in this text? What does the Bible say? It brings salvation, and what else? It teaches us, right, to do what? To deny ungodliness, ungodlikeness, everything that is not in accordance with God, with who God is or His character. And it lists some things, worldly lusts. Lust, you know, we have a commandment that says that we should not covet, right? Or lust. Uh, other things that don't belong to us, that we should live righteously. The Bible says that all God's commandments are righteousness in, in the book of Psalms. And then it says that we should, that this grace, this power of Christ enables us to live godly when? In this present world. We can have freedom and salvation today. We don't have to wait for Jesus to come to experience this freedom, but we can experience it today in Christ. And this is the grace that God is offering each one of us tonight, today. It's a, and then looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when we receive this grace in our lives, looking for Jesus coming will be a blessed hope. You've heard of the term blessed hope. This is where it comes from, right? Many people have a fear of what's coming. They have fear of Jesus coming and the uh, events taking place prior to that. But the Bible says that it is a blessed hope. Now, if you're hoping for something, it's usually a positive thing, right? You're not like dreading it, right? You're hoping. And it's a positive thing. And this experience God wants to have, uh, want us to have. And so he's offering us his grace. And the Bible says that he wants to redeem us from all iniquity. That is all sin. Now, is there a condition to be a follower of Jesus? We earlier learned about uh, how we can become followers of Jesus. And once we accept his gift, we want to 
be baptized, right? We want to learn um, what he taught, and we want to become his followers through baptism. But are there any conditions to be a follower of Jesus? Well, the Bible says in Matthew 19, there is a story, and it says that a one said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? That is the most important question one can ask. What do I need to do to have eternal life, right? And then he said unto him, that is Jesus, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Wow. Some people might be taken by surprise, like, wait a minute. I thought that we're saved by grace. What is, all, what is this commandment thing? Well, first of all, Jesus answers and says, Why do you call me good? You see, this young man who asked Jesus the, the question did not acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. He just thought he's a, he's a, he's a teacher, he's a master. And then he asked him, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus tells him to keep the commandments. Now, he said unto him, which? And Jesus says, and he quotes some of the commandments. He says, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So these are some of the Ten Commandments he quoted, right? And then he said, The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? He felt something was lacking because he asked this question, right? He sensed like there's something missing in my life. But Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. So the, he gave him a condition. If you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, Here's the condition. And what was his response? It's, the Bible says he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, did Jesus make it harder for him than for any other of his disciples? Doesn't the Bible say says that they forsook all and followed him? Perhaps this might have been a test, just like uh, the one that Abraham had, where God required him to sacrifice his own son just to see whether he was willing to do this. Of course, God knew that, but he wanted Abraham to know also his own heart and to teach him about the plan of salvation because God provided a sacrifice, right? So to be a follower of Jesus is it, not enough just to profess that he is our Lord or our Savior, but there are some things that he wants us to do, right? As we can see here. Now, in the Bible, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, I forgot to put the reference, uh, Jesus talks about things taking place prior to his coming, actually when he comes. And the Bible says not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, let me ask you a question. Who calls Jesus Lord today? Do atheists call him Lord? Do, I don't know, Hindus? No, right? There's only one group of people that call Jesus Lord. Who would that be? It would be Christians, right? So this, I believe, is specifically referring to Christians. He says, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And through, and through your name thrown out demons, and through your name do many wonderful works. So these people even claim that they have done miracles in the name of Jesus. But what does Jesus say? And then I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, those who work lawlessness. So what is the reason that Jesus turns away these people at the end of time? He calls them lawless or without law or lawbreakers, right? So just because somebody calls Jesus Lord does not mean that he's his follower, right? Because to call Jesus Lord means what? What, what does a servant do with the Lord? He obeys the Lord, right? Jesus is our Savior. We believe that, amen? amen. But if he's, he's our Savior, then he's also our Lord, right? And we need to do what he asked us to do. Now... 
The Bible talks about a special group of people in the end of time whom the devil especially hates. And we learned last night that in the book of Revelation, dragon was a symbol of who? Satan, right? And it says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we learned that in the beginning, right, uh, this war that we're engaged in started not this here on earth, but it was in heaven. And Jesus says that the devil is a, li a, the li a liar from the beginning, and he is the father of it, right? So he actually says what he did in heaven. He's deceived angels by lying, and this whole uh, mess that we're in started by Satan's deceptions in heaven, right? It started with pride, and then he deceived. So he hates God's law from the beginning, and he has made war against all those who want to keep his law, to be loyal and faithful to, to Jesus. Now, some people think that God's law was changed or repealed, especially in the New Testament, but Jesus said, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. These are the words of Jesus himself. Also, the Bible says that my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Now, who spoke the Ten Commandments? God himself, right? And so the Bible says that the thing that has gone out of his lips, he will not break. It will not annul, right? Now, the Bible says also that he's, all of his commandments are sure they stand fast forever and ever. And God also says in Malachi 3.6 that I am the Lord, I change not. Now, if we compare what the Bible says about who God is and about his law, we find the same thing, that God is good and the law is good. God is holy, so is the law. God is just, perfect, love, righteous, truth, pure, spiritual, unchangeable, eternal. Here we have references. We don't have time to read all the verses. If you like, I can share it with you later. But the same thing that the Bible says about God says about his law. Actually, the law of God is a reflection of who he is. Now, let us look for a moment the Ten Commandments and see what we can learn uh, as we read together. The Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Here, right in this first commandment, we see that God is portrayed as the one who saved people out of bondage. So once we are saved out of bondage, and bondage is a symbol of sin, right? Jesus says, those who commit sin are servants of sin, and that is bondage. Once we are free from bondage, then we should have no other gods. He gives us a reason, right? And then the second commandment says, you shall not make unto yourself any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or anything in the earth or that is in the water beneath. You shall not bow yourself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation, to those that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. God does not want us to make any image of him or anything and make it into an object of worship. Because it would degrade us. God wants us to get a picture of him from his word, not from the things around us. Because there's nothing around us that can truly represent who God is. And we can look around the world and see there are many nations, many people, groups, or tribes who worship idols, right? They worship gods that they make themselves. And it reflects in the, ways they, in the way they live their lives um, and how much they respect their fellow men and um, others. So God wants us to, uh, God does not want us to represent him in any, um, in anything that is created or anything that our hands can make. Now the next commandment says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that keep his name is vain. Now, you know, a lot of the commandments begin with thou shall not, right? 
And so it may seem as a negative statement or like something being forbidden. And yes, there is truth to that. But what God is actually saying, if you make me your Lord and Savior, you will not have other gods before me. I will be your God. You will not take my name in vain. These are actually 10 promises. What God wants to do in our lives as we receive his grace that we learn is his power to change us, to help us. Because it's the only way to be happy. The Bible also calls us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the fourth commandment. Six days we should, you should labor and do all your work. But the seven day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, nor uh, you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. God knew that we need rest and we need a special time with him. And so he, uh, right here in the center of his law, made it as one of the commandments. And I praise God that um, we can experience this every week. And it's be, it, it is a, a true blessing. Now, the next six commandments are talking about our relationship with each other, right? If you notice, the first four are dealing with how we should relate to God. The next six are talking about uh, our fellow man. And it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God giveth you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Every country has its own laws. And I tried to look up on the internet how many laws are in America, and really nobody knows. Uh, there's like thousands and thousands, right? And, uh, you, you know, even the lawmakers or the, or the lawyers, the judges, they probably don't know most of them. And yet God was able to succinctly make a perfect law in just Ten Commandments. And if you study them out, they actually cover every aspect of our lives. There's no area that they don't cover. Now you may say, well, it doesn't say anything about taking drugs. Well, it says that we should not kill. Any form of shortening life is a form of killing, whether it's a slow process or a longer process, right? Um, the Bible says that Jesus was going to magnify the law and make it honorable. And if you remember the teachings on the Mount of Blessings, there in Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus talked about uh, the Ten Commandments, as he said, you have heard of all that it was said, you should, not, you should not kill, but I tell you, if you hate your brother in your heart, you already have committed murder. So the law of God is not just an external conduct, that it's a checklist that we need to do, but it actually deals and shows our heart condition. But it is only by the grace of God that we can keep it. Now, many people have tried to keep it in their own strength. And have made additional laws to help them keep the 10 laws. I just recently came from Israel. And uh, they told me that they had 650 some. I, if, I, if I'm correct. That they uh, tried to keep. And so I guess 10 was not enough for them. So they added some more. But uh, God is very reasonable. He's not asking us to do anything that he's not willing to help us to do. Because his word is power. Remember when God spoke. He created in the beginning, the Bible says he spoke and things came to be. He spoke and it stood fast. Remember when the centurion uh, who had a sick servant came to Jesus and said, if you can come and heal my servant. Uh, actually, he didn't say that. He said, my servant is sick. And Jesus said, let me come and heal him. What did, what did he tell Jesus? He said, well, you know, I am, I am a kind of an important person. So, yeah, you should come to my house. No, he says, I'm not worthy. But the Jews said he was worthy because he built a synagogue. But he didn't see himself as worthy. None of us is worthy. But, G but he told Jesus, speak a word only and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, marveled and said, I have not found such faith, not even in Israel, among God's own people. He didn't find somebody who actually believed that his word has power to not just heal the, the body, but the soul. And so 
God is able to heal our own broken hearts. He is able to write His law on our hearts so that we can be happy. Now, the Bible says and uh, shows us what sin actually is. And the definition of sin is found in 1 John 3, 4. And the Bible says that sin is transgression of the law. That is the breaking of the law. That is the only way that we can know the difference between right and wrong, right? And we just read the Ten Commandments. Now, another purpose of the law is to give us a knowledge of sin, right? Paul says, I had not known sin by, by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now, did Jesus keep the commandments? Well, the Bible says, I have kept my Father's commandments. These are the words of Christ himself. According to the Bible, how many people have sinned? All, right? For all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. And what is the result? What is the reward of that? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now, have you received your wages this month yet? No, what is today? Uh, <laughs> wages is something that you earn, right? But salvation, the Bible says, is a gift, right? It's something we don't earn. It's something we receive. Now, some people believe that the law of God was changed in the New Testament, and now we are no longer obligated to keep it because Jesus died and he abolished it. But if God's law could be changed, it would not have been necessary for Jesus to die on the cross. Have you ever thought about that? The fact that Jesus paid the penalty for sin and died is proof that the law is unchangeable. Why couldn't God just say, okay, I forgive you. Lord, we're sorry. Okay, I forgive you. Why did Jesus have to die? Actually, did he have to die? If we were going to be saved, he did. But the question is why? Payment for our sins. And we just read that sin is what? Is transgression of the law. So Jesus had to die if we were going to be saved. Because the law could not be changed. It could not be altered. So Jesus told the young man, if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, this may be confusing for some, because how can we be saved by grace and then yet required to keep the law? We need to understand what is the cause of our salvation. We all know John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you tell me, what is the cause of salvation according to John 3.16? Jesus' love, that's right. Now, is, did Jesus die only for some or he died for all? What does the Bible say? He loved the whole world. God loved the world, right? The Father, and He gave His Son. Jesus died for all. Are all going to be saved then? Is there a condition in the verse? Who will be saved according to this verse? Whosoever believe. Now, that is a condition. We're not saved because we believe. We're not saved because we have faith. We're only saved because the love of God. But these are the conditions. The faith is a condition of salvation. The commandments of God are a condition. Now, my wife and I have been married for 10 years. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary. And thank you. <laughs> and so we understand that what keeps us together is love, love that we receive from God, each individually, and then sharing that love with each other. But we also know that to stay married, there are conditions, right? One of them, one of the most important would be to be faithful to one another, right? But she never came and said, you better be faithful, I'll divorce you. We never had that conversation even before we got married. Because we understand that this is a condition. This was not a cause of our marriage. This, was, this is just simply a condition. So also the commandments of God are a condition that Jesus put before us 
to be in relationship with Him. This is how we show our faithfulness to Him. But we need to remember that it is not in our own strength and ability to keep His commandments. He had set a high standard because He wants us to realize that we're inefficient, that we cannot attain it in our strength. And so we can see our need of Him, and we can see Him giving His life for us. What if I have already sinned, which the Bible says we all have, and transgressed the law? Is there any hope for me? Well, that's why Jesus, one of the reasons Jesus died on the cross is to pay for our transgressions. But he does not want us to continue in sin, as the Bible says. He wants us, he wants us to experience this new life in him. He wants us to be transformed. He wants to live within us and enable us to keep his law because that's the only way to be happy. I'm sure you uh, are distressed about everything that's happening in our world today. And we see the rise of all kinds of uh, crimes and um, not, nobody and nothing is safe anymore. Wherever you go, people are very fearful. But yet God gave us his law because he wanted us to be happy. It's not a bondage. It's not legalism. It's actually because he wants to set us free from sin. Sin is bondage not the law. Now, how is it possible to keep the commandments? We mentioned a few things, but the Bible says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, minds, and write them upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You may say, okay, well, that's for Israel. That's not for us. But Paul says that if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now he's talking about spiritual Israel. Whoever receives Christ as his personal savior, he is counted as the seed of Abraham. And all the promises that were made to him and his descendants are applied to us. So God promised to make a new covenant. So what's wrong with the old covenant? Well, remember, after God gave the Ten Commandments, the response of the people was what? They said, all that the Lord said we will do, right? And be obedient. And so they tried for a couple, almost thousand years, over thousand years. And were they successful? They were constantly uh, found to be transgressing God's law and had to be taken into as captives into different countries and bondage and so forth until... They realized that all this happened to them because they've been breaking God's law. So instead of realizing we cannot do it in our own strength, we need to depend on God, they came up with many additional laws. And so this is what happened after the Babylonian captivity, after they got back. So there's a couple hundred years between the Old and the New Testament period. And they came up with many different laws to help them keep the Ten Commandments because they realize if, we, if we're not obedient, then um, all these things happen to, uh, will happen to us again. So they didn't understand that it is by the grace and power of God alone that they can be faithful to Him. The Bible makes some promises to us that how we can be successful in keeping his law. It says, I can do all things in Philippians 4.13 through Christ which strengthens me. How many things? Is there anything that we cannot do according to the Bible? Paul says that the love of Christ constrains us. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now love comes first. Remember that. But the love of Christ constrains us. Jesus is not saying, prove that you love me and keep the commandments and then I will see if if I'm going to let you come into my kingdom. No, he actually puts his love into our hearts and then he wants us to respond because the love of Christ, Paul says, constrains us. And in 1 John 5, 3, we read that for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. It is the love of God that enables us to keep His commandments. It is His love, His power that is manifested in our obedience to Him. It is not something that we can perform or, uh, or do on our own. 
We already mentioned this, so we can go, go on. We're almost out of time. So, doesn't living under grace by faith make keeping God's law non-essential? Well, Paul says in Romans 6.15, What then shall we sin? Which we already read is what? It's transgression or breaking God's law. Because we are not under law, but under grace, God forbid. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. We establish the law. So the grace of God, we already learned, is a power of God that enables us to be faithful. So when we are under grace, we're actually keeping the law, not breaking the law. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is how we show our love for him. He that had my commandments and keep it, and he is he that loved me. And he that loved me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You see how love and commandments are connected? They're not separated. It's not a checklist. It's our response to his love that he puts in our hearts. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and I abide in his love. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now remember we read in Matthew 7 that many will say, Lord, Lord, we did this and we that, did that in your name. And he says, I never knew you. And here he says, hereby we know that we know him. What counts at the end is, are we obedient to what he says? Not, it's not just an emotional um, experience or just a feeling in our heart. Although there may be feeling and nothing wrong with that as long as it's um, according to God's word, right? The Bible also promises and says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Now, do you see here it's a condition, right? We, ask, we receive what we ask because we keep his commandments. Now, if you still wonder, I'm not sure about this. I don't know if we really need to keep the commandments. All you need is to flip the book to the end. And we're pretty much at the end of the book, Revelation 22:14. 14. And the Bible talks about those who will have the right to the tree of life. Remember, the tree of life was in the garden. And Adam and Eve, through transgression, forfeited their privilege to eat of this tree and perpetuate their immortality. Now, of course, it was through the power of God. The Bible says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of that city. And God promised each one of us, He made a provision, just like He made a provision for me, to be able to enter the country, um, so he wants to make, he already actually made a provision for each one of us to be part of his kingdom. Now, remember the, uh, last night we talked about um, briefly Daniel chapter 3. And we find there Daniel's friends who were challenged by king's command. He made a decree and he made an image of gold. And he ordered that everyone as an act of worship and homage and respect to him, bows down to this image. But Daniel's friends decided to be faithful to God because they knew that the first two commandments forbid this. The first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. The second one said, not to make any image or any likeness and to bow yourself to them. And they refused even under the penalty of death. Now, the, the threat was that they would be thrown in the fiery furnace. But they chose to remain faithful to God. And we know, according to Bible prophecy, that at the end of time, God's people will be challenged again to transgress God's law under great pressure. But we can still look forward to Jesus coming because the Bible says, to, that we can have hope, a blessed hope, right? We don't have to be afraid because we see what happened with them and God promised the same will be with us. When they were thrown into the fire, what happened? Jesus came 
and was right in the midst there with them. And they gave a witness to the whole world of the power and the grace of God. Now, they did not survive because some great works they have done. They didn't boast and say, well, we deserve it because all the good things we have done. Or all the bad things we don't do. It was alone the grace of God that saved them. It is alone the grace of God that can save us from our sins. And so Jesus is offering us his grace tonight. And he wants us to respond to him. And Jesus said to each one of you and me tonight, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments because of what I've done for you. If this is your desire tonight, I uh, invite you to raise your hand. If you want to keep God's commandments and receive His grace and His power in your life to help you be faithful and obedient. And let us uh, pray and ask God's help in our decision. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we recognize that your standard is perfect and your ways are righteousness and truth. And we cannot attain to it in our own strength. But Lord, you promise that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. And Lord, perhaps there were many times we tried to rely on our own strength. Or perhaps we just blatantly transgress your law. But tonight we recognize that your love constrained you to give your life for us. And you invite each one of us, Lord, to respond back in being faithful and obedient. And it's not an arbitrary law that you just put before us things that we have to do. But it is, some, it is the only, thing, only way that we can be happy. And we know this world will be a different place if we would acknowledge and accept your law as the standard of righteousness, as the standard of our lives. So Lord, we pray for your grace to help us tonight, that this can become a reality in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for paying the price for us and giving us this opportunity. And I pray that each one of us here will be saved into your kingdom, Lord, and our families and as many people as we can influence, Lord. We thank you for your love and we commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name, amen.